from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I am very pleased to have with me Bill joining me from Virginia in the U.S., Bill, thank you very much for being on the show. The way I like to do it, I keep it for my guests to introduce themselves because, you know, no one can introduce himself better than himself or herself, right? So uh, thank you for being, I know you're a veteran name in, 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 in the tech world, uh, but just, you know, for, uh, for the audience to get more about you and uh, what you do. I uh, probably, the longest stretch of my career was at Sun, where I had every staff job ended up as chief strategy officer and left there to go to AOL where I was the chief technology officer and went through the merger with uh, Time Warner and can tell many stories about that and have in another book. But uh, I started out, uh, I was going to be chemist, then I was going to be an economist. Economics led me into statistics. Statistics led me into even more computing. And I now have evolved to being largely technologist and then I got involved with media and I've spent much of my career on the frontier between media and, and technology. Uh, so I, I have three professions that I can bounce among economists, statistician, and computer scientists, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at all three, but, uh, I'm not great. I mean, there are better people than me in every one of those those fields, but the strength has always been the ability to walk between them. Yeah, sure. For sure. Uh, again, thank you, Bill, for being here today. Like, you know, I'm impressed with this, um, you know, long experience that you have. And I I'm sure, you know, like this is out of curiosity, honestly, I'm asking you, like you, you have witnessed, you know, most significant technological shifts. Um, you know, but which one, you know, do you say, you say, you can say, yeah, this was one of the main significant one. It can be one or more. And how these shifts have shaped the current state of technology and, and business, in your opinion? I like to focus on abstraction layers. Mm -hmm. And computing is still the same. I mean, if you, I was on an airplane the other day and they had to reboot the inner, the in plain entertainment system, which starts with the Linux boot file. You watch the Linux boot up, you realize all this stuff is just piled, unpiled, unpiled, unpiled into this huge stack. And you sit there and select movie and it plays. But at some point, it had to actually tell the processor where to go find the boot file and, and crank up all the way. Subtraction layers really matter. The transition that was really dramatic, I think, was client-server, network computing. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, it's still the model we use today on our smartphones. I mean, it, it is just there are lots of clients and lots of servers, but uh, the architectural model hasn't changed very much since then. But surely, the biggest transition in lives has been the smartphone. I mean, uh, I owned the Nokia 95 and 95 which was the best uh, smartphone anybody had seen at its time. Uh, and you look at it, and, and the problem with the smartphone was that if you were writing for that device, every application had to be phone call aware. Every application had to understand that a phone call might come in. There might be a phone call ongoing. That, and it was very hard to write an application. And the genius of the iPhone is that it was just client-server computing. And you didn't need to know anything at all about phone calls to write an app for the iPhone. And that was, a you know, if you know the name Avi Tavanian, he was the head of software at the time at Apple. And that was Avi's great insight 
was that at the speed of the processor at that time, voice could just be another application. And I don't think anybody saw on the initial launch how big it was. I was chairman of Opera Software at the time. And mm -hmm. I, I waited in line and got an iPhone and I brought it to Norway. And the engineers proceeded to tell me why it was destined to be a failure. Uh, they were wrong. Uh, uh, because they didn't, they never thought through. But at the time, the first one didn't have any amps. So the right. initial iPhone had no amps. And Steve Jobs had a big fight with the engineers because they wanted to put a camera on and he didn't think a camera should be there. He kept saying people use pic cameras to take pictures, not their phones. He, you know, he, he was, you know, brilliantly wrong. Uh, and they ended up putting on a, a, a cheap camera over his, you know, eventually relented. But, you know, the device that has emerged is, you know, it, it would not be the same device if it didn't have GPS. Right. I mean, the iPhone is client server computing with GPS and a camera. And it's combination that has made it so dominant. And then, you know, Eric Schmidt was at the board meeting and realized that this was right. And that's where Android came from. Uh, so you have these two competing platforms in the world. But that, you know, certainly that has been the vehicle. I mean, without the smartphone, I, you never would have had it. And then uh, when Facebook was going public, uh, Jamath went all around the world convincing carriers to make Facebook data free. And that in the rest of the world gave Facebook its predominance because it was free and the other ones weren't. Uh, and so you've got network activity going on everywhere. So that, you know, I mean, in terms of social scale, that has to be it. But in terms of architecture, it really was client server computing, which basically happened in the early nineties. Right. And, and, and I think you know, thanks to the invention of the internet that made also this like more widespreadly, like available for people like us as and the customers, right, Bill? Yeah. I mean, I. I built an IP network in 1990. Uh, we had a network all over the world for something. It was an IP network before the internet, right? And, and you know, we had email that was delivered in a minute. I mean, people today cannot imagine in 1990, you, you could actually send an email and it might show up in three days uh, uh, because of UCP. And, and uh, you know, somebody else would store and forward it. And when they got a connection, they would pass it on. I mean, really, you had email taking minutes, hours, even days. You know, today we expect it to take seconds, uh, and in general, it is second. Uh, so that that certainly brought the smartphone into it, and you're right to observe that. Uh, but I mean, the you could have done the smartphone revolution if everybody had a private network and they interoperated. It's just that the internet made that a lot simpler. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Now, uh, Bill, if you allow me, you know, your new book, uh, which is right. called The New Technology State. So, um, you know, from the, you know, the briefing I had, it's like about discussing how technology has changed our world. So can you share the core thesis of the book and what would be the main benefits for technologists and entrepreneurs to read it and go through it? Well. I was at, when I was in my economist days, I spent five years working with John Kenneth Galbraith at Harvard and Galbraith at the time, and this is the early seventies, repeatedly made the assertion that the global elite would use technology to gain wealth and power. Turns out he was right. Uh, and Sam Lesson, uh, uh from Facebook and how, you know, the information just posted that one of his concerns or observations anyway, about the AI revolution is that it's going to even further increase the amount of inequality because the people who learn early how to use and exploit it will be able to gain both wealth and power. And so what technology has done unintentionally, I mean, up until, you know, probably the invention of the iPhone, uh, was almost universally bringing good, more good than bad to, to our societies and economies. 
But today we've ended up divided. We've ended up being very unequal and we've built in many ways, a very fragile system. And, you know, what happened is that we made software innovation very easy. I mean, when I was a graduate student, innovation was hardware and it didn't happen quickly. And there was a limited number of people and it took huge capital to do. But today one person can write software that changes the world. There was a story recently uh, from Robert Scoble, who is the, the you know pretty fa famous reporter out of Silicon Valley, and he tweeted that he was visiting SpaceX, and he asked to see the team that wrote the software that took the rocket into space and landed it back on the launch pad. And he said he wanted to meet that team, and they said, "Okay, he's over there." And you don't know, I want to meet the team, and they go, "Well, there's only one." <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the power of this platform is that one human being can write it. One of the central theses of the book is around something called Halstead Lane, which goes back to a professor from Purdue in the 80s, Maurice Halstead. And he was curious about why were some people hundreds of times better than others in developing software. And he came up with some metrics around. And what he discovered was that the very best people are two to 300 times better than the average. And he gave an explanation, of which is basically the length of memory chunk that a human being has. We don't know where this comes from. I mean, the Aborigine in Australia that know where every water hole is in the outback and the roots between them obviously have it or a London cab driver who has memorized the knowledge and knows all that. I mean, this is not just an intellectually, uh, but it is a very important trait. And what I would argue is that there are a limited number of these people in the world. I mean, tens of thousands, not millions. And that the tech giants hired them all. And, and so that gives them a huge, uh, advantage over everybody else. And, you know, you'd have to consider Tesla the tech giant. I mean, there was an interview uh, recently with the CEO of Ford Motor, and he was explaining his problem, which is that in the Ford Lightning, there are 150 software suppliers, and the truck is an integration across 150 software suppliers, and they don't own the software. Uh, Tesla has one software stack and one chip. I have 150 software suppliers and many, many, many chip sets. Well, you can't win. You, 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 you can't win at that. Uh, so the tech giants can afford to pay millions of dollars a year to some of these brilliant developers. And that would be, I mean, I can't imagine uh, a Ford or GM or uh, Mercedes or BMW paying a software developer, you know, 3 million euros a year. I, I just... I mean, that would be so anti-cultural, uh, it'd be very hard to do, yet the, the big tech companies understand that that's what these people are worth and aggregating them into teams of like people is makes them even more valuable. So you've got a monopoly here that is by owning the talent and everybody else is fighting over the, the non A plus programmers, but the A plus programmers are 10, 20, a hundred times more productive than everybody else. And so you've ended up in a world that, you know, is, you know, unequal, uh, uh, fragile, because most of the software is really bad because it's not, you know, the, the tech giants have good software. Everybody else has mediocre software. And then, you know, if you look at the 2016 election for president in the United States, the way that Donald Trump won was brilliant. He spent 150 million on Facebook in the last three weeks of the campaign. And he spent it in five counties. There are about 3,500 counties in the United States. He spent mm -hmm. it in five, only five. And those were his margin of victory. And Facebook allowed him to buy ads by name. So I could buy an ad and it would only show to you. In fact, there's a story which it was repeated. Who knows whether it's true or not is that the Labour Party in Britain had a lot of pressure from their then leader, Jeremy Corbyn, to run some ads. And the party management thought they were terrible. 
So they ran the ads on Facebook with by name advertising only to Jeremy Corbyn. So he logged on to Facebook and he saw the ads, but nobody else ever saw them. But that's, you know, again, you couldn't have done that, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and it, it, you know, that's how Trump won. I mean, he ran ads in these five counties to Afro-Americans that had Hillary Clinton praising three strikes and you're outlaw, which says that if you're convicted of three crimes, you go to prison for life. And that is today regarded as the most racist legislation ever passed in the United States. And he ran ads on that in these five counties and he suppressed voting. Uh, I mean, it's a very different world. And our legislators and regulators, they don't have a clue. I'm sorry. I mean, I, 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 I mean, you listen to their questions uh, and hearings and whatever, and they're very, very few, very, very few. Uh, so, you know, what, what, what do we do about it? Because, I mean, I, I, I believe in competition as a means of disciplining the market. And if you don't have competition, the market does what the market does, which is it goes to monopoly and you end up with bad things. And you also get a society that's fragile because you're very dependent on a handful of people and a handful of software stacks. So if you have a handful of software stacks, then hacking becomes very easy and you got a cybersecurity risk. So, uh, on the other hand, I'm a conservative and I don't believe in massive government regulation, but I do believe that government has to set the rules and then get out of the way. And so I argue that, you know, the government should enact some taxes. I mean, there's no need for people to accumulate personally identifiable information unless it's really valuable. So. Mm -hmm. I would tax people who use it so that if they don't do it gratuitously, uh, uh, that they do it, uh, only because they're going to make real money from it. And if they do fine then pay some tax back for the costs imposed on society by doing. So I'm trying to get a, a conversation because we're headed toward regulation. I mean, the EU is already racing down that, path, but they want that to be regulation that will mean the government bureaucrats are going to be in the middle of every corporate system. And I don't think that's good for privacy, security, innovation, or anything. At least my experience, I had a encounter with bureaucrats over cryptocurrency and uh, I was a witness. That's all. But, uh, it was scary how little they understood about how technology worked. And yet uh -huh. they're preparing to enact regulation in that very broad scope. Yeah. Bill, actually, you, you brought a lot of thought-provoking discussions, I would say. And, uh, you know, but I, I would, I would ta try to tackle them one by one. So let's start, let's start with, you know, something you, you, you discussed at the end, maybe, which is about the big tech and the competition. Now... In a couple of episodes back, I was, um, you know, uh, interviewing a CTO of one of the AI companies and they rely, you know, on other companies' technologies, of course. And the question when I asked him, I said, aren't you afraid that one day this big, you know, it's, it's open AI, it's not something to hide, which is backed by Microsoft. I said, if these guys, they decide to cut the, you know, the, the, the cable on you, they cut <laughs> the current on you. You're in the dark, right? So how are you managing this? And he was, you know, like he was shocked. He said, you know what? I never thought about this this way. So from what do you think, we, you know, something can be done? You know, we, you said regulations, but do you think is it enough to just put policies and how we can make sure that on the long run, um, you know, we have access to, to the technology available for everyone and, you know, we can have alignment actually with these big techs in, instead of being like in competition with them. Well, that's a, you know, that is a profound question to which there is no simple answer. And it will probably take us a decade of experimentation to figure out, uh, what to do. Certainly. I mean, you know, bizarrely, maybe I go after the executive compensation schemes in the United States. 
And that is what drives a lot of this. And a lot of it is because of, there's a huge tax break to the tech companies. And the tech companies get to deduct the actual value received by an employee for a stock award. But that's not a cash expense. And they don't have to show that same expense on their profit and loss statement. So they can show large profitability and yet pay almost no taxes because they get to deduct all the gains. So as long as you can create a wheel in which the stock price goes up and you do that to whatever means, hype even, uh, that allows you to pay your employees a lot. And a company that is paying cash can't even compete. They have no, no ability uh, to, to compete. So if you don't reform that system in some way that balances it more, uh, um, you're always going to give a huge advantage to companies that can have an ever rising stock price that allows them to overpay and get a tax break. I, I mean, it's brilliant for them. Uh, so that certainly allows, you know, that's what drives these companies uh, and, and they make money down. Uh, so. Uh, if you just flipped it and said that the employees got capital gains treatment on those investments and the companies had to expense, you know, the, you know, whatever they do, they, they run into the expense. You just flip the taxation so they couldn't deduct that value. And then so the employees got the tax benefit. A, you make it more feasible for other people to play and you take away the enormous recruiting advantage that these mm -hmm. companies I mean, if you're, if you're a brilliant programmer and Google offers you potentially a million, $2 million a year over five years to be a programmer, why are you going to go work someplace for $500,000? Uh, I mean, and the, it, you know, the tax advantage basically gives these the tech giants a huge advantage in recruiting the very best talent. And when they get the very best talent, they get the best productivity and you know, I, I like to say that it allows them to pay above market, but below value. So oh, they pay way above market and, and get these people and, but it's way below the value they get. And when the, mm -hmm. the a friend of mine was the first VP of engineering at Google, and the first thing he did was fire all the middle managers. And he said, he's trying to put a mediocre programmer manager in charge. 15 geniuses is just not a good idea. So he lets the programmers self-direct. And that's been what has driven Google for a long, long time is they get enormous productivity out of the programming teams and they get innovation. They, whether that's still going on or not is something we're going to see as we watch them compete in AI now. But, mm -hmm. you know, other people, you know, I like to say, Mehmet, that I think that the future of every company is going to resemble a sports team and you're going to have players and you're going to have employees and the players, unfortunately are not easily identifiable. I know I can easily look at Messi and understand that he's a very good player and nobody objects when he's paid enormous amounts of money, but I can't, right. I don't look at a software developer and realize that that human being is the equivalent of a Messi in software and mm -hmm. special sports teams had figured out how to manage an enterprise with two classes of employees, but big companies, especially unionized big companies have an enormous problem. Google, Meta, Amazon do not, they know how to do it. They know how to, to recognize and it's accepted part of the culture and that everybody realizes who these superstars are and compensating them. But as long as the tech giants end up with all the talent, it's, you know, not, not a fair fight. Uh, uh, there is, people have always wondered what made the Vikings so successful when they were conquering the world. And, you know, less than a decade ago, people figured out that one Viking, oh, obviously, made its way to Iran or Iraq and brought back the secret of making steel. And so the Vikings had a thousand steel swords. 
And that's what they use to conquer the world. Because if you have an iron sword and I have a steel sword, you're dead. Because I can mm -hmm. cut a flaring sword in half on the first stroke, and then you don't have any sword, and I do. It's not a fair fight at that. So right. like, you know, a small number of people. I mean, it, it may be, you know, it's probably total, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, uh, but has allowed them to dominate because nobody else has that talent. And if you, you know, if you have all the steel swords in the world, you're going to beat iron swords, no matter how good the swordsman. And that's, yeah, that, that, that's the challenge. So it, you know, and we're all very dependent. I mean, we, we sit on top of a software stack. And now that software act is heavily open source, but the open source almost always goes back to one company as the provider and innovator in that stack. And they, you know, I mean, there's no CTO in the world that understands every layer of the stack that they're on. And then you look in the AI world, they're all on CUDA, which is the software from NVIDIA. And that's their lock-in. If you've got everything written in that, you can't easily move anyplace else because you're dependent on CUDA. You got a monopoly supply. So okay, I know one's going to go buy NVIDIA today because, you know, but the value isn't CUDA. The value isn't, I mean, the basic design of a, of a GPU is direct NICs. And that comes from Alex St. John, you know, over 20 years ago at Microsoft. They just put it in hardware. Uh, uh, so, I mean, there isn't a lot of advantage there. The advantage is in, uh, is, is in CUDA, but I think you're correct in your initial question that you asked, which is that if I'm a CEO at some point, I'm going to turn around and go, okay, what's your resiliency strategy? How are you going to build a, a platform for me? That I'm not going to get taken out because my supplier gets caught, my supplier gets hacked. Uh, Somebody finds a hole in CUDA, and with that, I can shut off all of my recommendation engine. I mean, I don't, but I mean, I think that, you know, resiliency is going to move to one of the, you know, right now it's cybersecurity, but that's just the narrow aspect, really, of resilience. And I think that's going to change the world for CTOs all over. Yeah, dear, like 100%, I agree with you. Like, I'd say we, we, we will have to, to uh, wait and see how it happens now. You mentioned also, you know, AI and the ethics of AI. So a lot of debates, you know, a lot of voices. A um, couple of months back, there was the famous letter signed by, you know, uh, people like Steve Wozniak and others. Um, and well, some people, they say, no, you know, let the companies control themselves. Some people, they say, no, but we cannot uh, figure out if one guy inside this company might do something wrong. So what do you think, you know, policymakers, businesses, and technologists should do, or how should they collaborate, let's say, to ensure that we have responsible innovation? Well, the big clinker that's coming in AI is the question of copyrighted content. And can AI use copyrighted content without permission and without compensation? And OpenAI did. OpenAI went out and they hoovered up the internet and they didn't pay anybody. They didn't tell anybody and they wrote Jack with PT. And that's what other people have done. There's a potentially forthcoming lawsuit from the New York Times against OpenAI, which will ask that they destroy ChatGPT and start over again without using New York Times content. Uh, uh, so that sits there uh, uh, off to the side. The issue of regulating um, AI is that it's out of the bag. So there are countries in the world which are not going to care about this, will not care about any regulation, and will build AI that is even better than anybody else. So if you say to countries that respect legal things, uh, your AI is going to suck compared to the people who don't, it's not good. I mean, in... 1990, you know, when it was 20, 2019, the U.S. Air Force did a fly-off in which they flew their five best fighter pilots in a simulator against AI. 
And the AI won every chart, everyone. And the reason at the end was simple. The AI can fly the plane at the limits of the plane. The human pilots had to fly at the limits of the human. So AI is, is going to matter in, unfortunately, combat. And you're going to want the best AI. And so, I mean, it, it, countries are going to face really tough choices about what they do because the learning skills may be learned in a lot of copyrighted content. They may not seem directly applicable, but AI is learning all the time and, and building up its, its knowledge uh, algorithms. So I, I don't know a government regular, well, there may be a few more in the UK than in the US, but I mean, we're not, the government isn't staffed to do this. I mean, you, you, if you're a brilliant AI programmer today, your starting salary in the U.S. is a half a million dollars and your top salary may be 10 times that. I mean, the government doesn't offer jobs like that. I mean, okay, an $80,000 a year job in the government, you know, 10, 000, you know 100,000 euros maybe. But I mean, I don't know how they're going to regulate it. I mean, it's very, I mean, regulating technology is never, it's always, people have always found a way around it. And I think people would, you know, you need responsibility, um, accountability. I mean, there is, um, there is a movement to make people make algorithms and make them accountable for them. And that's certainly going to happen in healthcare because mm -hmm. the algorithm is basically like a drug. And it, in the end, it'll be released like a drug and it's going to be for liability reasons because if somebody dies because the algorithm makes a mistake, then everybody's going to be wanting to point fingers as to who faults, whose fault it was. <laughs> so I think you have to say that if you have an algorithm, you have to, and you're using it to make consequential decisions, you're accountable and you're accountable for that algorithm. And if you don't follow responsible behavior uh, around testing it and releasing it, I mean, that, that helps, but you know, I will say this, that never in my history of technology have we ever been pushing a new technology that is commonly known to have hallucinations. And yet every AI researcher out there says, oh, well, yeah, well, they're hallucinations. Oh, yeah, 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 that's an hallucination. Well, no, I, I mean, if that hallucination causes my plane to crash, I don't, you know, I don't think of it as just a hallucination. And yet people dismiss it. You know, they go, oh, yeah, well, yeah, and we just make stuff up. Well, it's the nature of the beast. Uh, that's going to be the problem as well. I mean, because, you know, in, in the Cold War, we built a uh, distant early warning system that was going to detect um, a, a USSR launch of missiles on the United States. And the first day that it went live, um, it detected a Russian launch. And Fortunately, the major on duty hit the bypass button because he thought it unlikely that the Russians would pick the instant the system went live to launch them. That didn't seem to him to make any sense. It was the moon. Come on, wow. area. Uh, and, and I mean, I, I do worry about this. I mean, I, I, I mean, in the late 70s, uh, I helped a group that testified in Congress about the dangers of computer fired anti-aircraft missiles. Because uh, at the time it took 6,000 decisions per second to launch an anti-aircraft missile. And so the only way to do that was computers, but we were actually letting computers make decisions that could lead to war. And I mean, that's, so I don't, I don't, I don't think you can regulate. If I were Sam Altman running open AI, I would want regulation. Because regulation ensures no Mm -hmm. doing is if you're in the lead, you want regulation so that new competitors are burdened and have trouble coming in. Uh, that's been true in every industry. I mean, once you get your, your dominant market share, then you want regulation so that new people can't enter. Uh, so there are economic motives here that uh, I think may affect positions. Uh, but I don't, I mean, I, I, how do you regulate AI? I don't even know what that's saying. <laughs> uh, you know, Ben, like the other, you know, 
couple of months back, I was chatting with someone and, you know, when, especially the letter came out from uh, uh, Steve Wozniak and the others, and I think even Elon Musk was pushing, well, saying the same thing. And they said, look, like if OpenAI decides today to stop developing, right? Someone else, already this, this, these models are available out in the wild. So someone simply in a, as you said, in a country where there's no regulations or maybe even as a hobbyist, he might just try to do something with it. So how we can stop it? So well, your software it's is open source from Google, right? The software comes from deep minds, how Google, you know, integrated into Google. It's open source. So any, anybody. I don't think that the idea that someone's going to do this at home, I mean, the plant on which chat GPT was trained cost a lot of money, maybe, you know, maybe billions, uh, to go build up all those data centers, but somebody who could write a 50 or a hundred or $200 million check could certainly take that software and go train it. Um, and that's all you need. And the stuff is there in the cloud to certainly you could buy the computing on the margin, you don't have to go build data centers. So I don't, um, yeah, you, you can't, you know, genies are out of the bottle. Um, you're not going to put it back in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like this and, you know, like beyond, um, you know, but maybe it's like a futuris futuristic question. So beyond, you know, generating text and, you know, images. What we could expect from this technology, what it could lead us actually? Well, I mean, I mean, one of the arguments of the new technology state is that this is just an algorithm. I mean, AI is just an algorithm. It's just a very, it's got 2 billion parameters instead of a hundred, but it's just an algorithm in the end. And we've been going through a life history here in our last 20 years of algorithms running our lives. And algorithms already run our lives. I mean, they determine what we pay for an airline seat. They determine whether an airline seat's available. Uh, 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 they're driving our cars in part. I mean, algorithms are, you know, driving healthcare. Um, you know, I think the most exciting stuff that I've seen is inventing new drugs. And, and that could have enormous impact on it. What the political scientists are worried about is the ability to do completely personalized advertising. And that's effectively what Trump did is he used algorithms on his own database to pick the people that he ran these ads to because these ads would be offensive to a lot of people and no one else saw them except the people he targeted. So nobody even knew about them. And yet they were very, very effective. So you get, you get to do that, but look, and AI is just like a child. And as it grows, it gets smarter. And there isn't going to be one massively smart AI because every AI is different depending upon what it was trained on, the order in which it was trained, the hints that it was given, the experience it has had. So you're going to have to have a lot of it. What I think is the fatal flaw of AIs is I don't know how they build trust. I mean, when we go do a massive project and we put it together, the ability of humans to collaborate depends in the end on trust and we can build up relationships and we've been evolving trust as a species for 2 million years. And we know how I can trust you and you can trust me. And the, I mean, I don't know how you do that with AI because one thing we know about AI is they lie with impunity. And, and people have had lots of experiments. I saw one where, uh, it was lying to somebody to get them to do a capture. Today, they can do captures, but it was a year ago when it wasn't very good. And it lied to somebody to get him to do the capture for it. It said it was, a, he was a disabled person and he couldn't see, and he was vision impaired. And would he please help him out? And the guy eventually did. Um, uh, I mean, so I don't know how you build trust and this inability to build trust is going to be a big deal. I mean, I, I, I use the app uh, from Quora. And I go to, you know, the majority of my searches now are done on Poe, not on Google. And I ask the AI and I get better answers faster, uh, unless something is really current, in which case it doesn't work because, you know, yeah. but I mean, if you ask, if you asked an ancient person 
who was the most skilled, you know, human on earth 2000 years ago, they give you an answer to every question. Some of them we would think ludicrous, but that was to the best of their knowledge at the time. Uh, and sometimes it's wrong. I mean, the, uh, we uncovered a, uh, a burial site in Peru, archeologists did a few years ago and the Incas were fighting climate change. And to the best of their knowledge, the way to do that was a mass sacrifice of children to the gods. Mm -hmm. But they killed 240 children on one day. Uh, but I mean, AI is just like that. I mean, it gives you the best answer it has to the knowledge it's been trained in. But no AI is going to be trained in all knowledge. And dissent in the end is the essence of innovation. If you don't dissent, you don't innovate. You don't say there's a better way. And, and you go find it. And so AI is not going to, I don't think, invent dissent. It's designed to tell you the conventional wisdom. And going back to my time with Galbraith, there's one thing that Galbraith taught me is the conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. Uh, and, you know, you have to go the next layer down. Mm -hmm. Or Peter Rucker uh, quoted many times as saying, a decision made unanimously is clearly wrong. Because all that proves is that you haven't probed the issue deep enough to uh, there. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's the world we live in. I think people are, I don't understand some of what people are saying. Are there a lot of jobs that are going to go away? And mm -hmm. The idea that you've had a lifetime career, that's, that certainly has gone almost everywhere. I mean, uh, I was at a golf course recently where they put in AI driven lawnmower and the lawnmowers go out, the GPS directed and they cut the grass. There used to be a team of humans that did that. I see. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these lawnmowers, when their power runs low, they know when they have to go back and plug in and recharge, they can, they can mow grass at night because, uh, they don't need vision. They're doing it off a GPS cord. Uh, I mean, what the job. I mean, junior analyst in financial companies, I mean, I can feed a company report into, uh, quad and say, you know, is this division profitable? And it'll give me an answer. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, lots of jobs are going to change and people who learn how to employ, um, AI to make their jobs easier and themselves more productive are going to be winners. But they're going to be fewer of those, and they're going to be losers. So what? So what we will be doing, Bill? Like, what is actually this was my next question to you? And what is the future of jobs? I would say, like, I would not say future of what in terms of uh, remote or in office. I mean, by as humans, what we will be doing if if majority of the things machines can do. Well, you you're making an assumption there that may not be correct, which is majority. Okay. Uh, I mean, AI has no common sense. So how important is common sense? How important is common sense that the major on duty at the radar system goes, I don't think the Russians would be picking today to attack and stop it. AI would have said, Jeff Defcon one launch nuclear war. Uh, so common sense matters and matters a lot. And there's all this stuff that's going to be beyond your training set. But somehow or other, we as humans are able to, to reason around that and, and, you know, and respond accordingly. So, um, that, you know, um, I, I don't know that the world changes, right? But the, I mean, look, the way we solved this problem before was we reduced the labor force. I mean, if you look at the thirties, again, going back to being the communist. In the United States, what Franklin D. Roosevelt did that solved the problem as much as he could is he put in 40 hour a week and he created an option for people to retire. So he shrank the workforce and we're going to have to shrink the workforce. I mean, that's what you're saying. Now, the question is, how, right. do, we, 
how do we afford that? How we do it is we shrink the workforce. How we pay for it is the question that is going to be debated. But you're going to mm-hmm. have, you, you, and you're going to have to figure out how to give the people who are retired meaningful way to spend their time. And that will become the second challenge. I don't, I, I don't have any problem in predicting that we're going to shrink the workforce. Already. We've already shrunk it. The percentage of labor force participation keeps going down. And it goes down because um, of many factors, the pandemic being a, a big, you know, major structural change. But, um, that, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. How we afford it is going to be the great policy debate. And, and unfortunately, there isn't any politician around talking about it. There's no one who wants to bring that subject up and, and talk about it because it, it's a very, you know, it's a third rail subject. But I mean, you know, in, in the thirties, you did it by putting in 40 hour work weeks and, uh, by putting in, uh, early retirement with social security in the U S and that's how he did it. And that's what we're going to have to do. Mm-hmm. But we, a lot of the, I mean, AI will probably help more energy efficient. It will probably help us do other things, but then you get back to what the pandemic taught us is that we over optimized on efficiency and forgot about robustness. And then we became very fragile and supply chains broke everywhere. So, you know, um, most of the corporate data in the world is still sitting on IBM mainframes, you know, that I, I, I mean, they're still got an $8 billion business selling mainframes. Uh, I mean, that should, that should caution us. I mean, then why? <laughs> well, right. I mean, there's a lot of software in the world that's 40 years old and that software is running. Right. Um, and nobody around, I mean, I read the other day that Bloomberg terminal, you know, the most, you know, very influential system re- written in Fortran and they have a lot of trouble hiring people because people don't Fortran is something they learned about in computer history class. It's not something you learned about how they program, right? Or companies that discover that they own, you know, 200,000 lines of COBOL. Well, there isn't anybody under 45 that is a COBOL expert. I mean, we got lots of obsolete software. And that, I mean, innovation has, is a two-sided coin. The other side of the coin is obsolescence. And the hardest problem for society to deal with is obsolete people. And, and AI will make a lot of people obsolete. They may be very talented individuals, but you know, can you teach, you know, I mean, we've tried in this country to teach people how to be coders, but AI is going to eliminate a lot of those jobs, not by eliminating coding. I mean, my friends that are brilliant programmers tell me that chat GPT doubles their productivity. It just means you need fewer programmers. Uh, and the, the really good ones can use it and the not so good ones can't. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I actually, like, I'm not a, you know, like I come from a technology background, but I was not a coder, but you know, like I, I feel now I have superpowers because whenever I want to do something that maybe a Python script will automate for me something. So I give it to chat GPT. It does it for me, you know, and right. It's like, it's like, um, it's like the augmentation thing that they talk about now. But, but we know from research that chat GPT is full of security holes and, yes. and so that was what I was is at least twice as likely to insert bugs as a human person doing the same job. So, uh, I mean, you know, we'll get better. Yes. I mean, but we'll get perfect. Perfection is very hard. Uh, Elon Musk talks about how great full self-driving is. Well, for random historical reasons, because of when I bought my Tesla, I'm one of the 75 or 80,000 people who has the full self-driving uh, beta. And, you know, it's 95% accurate. It's really pretty good. The problem is, is that driving, you can't be 95% accurate. 
you have to be 99.9999% accurate. And, you know, I don't know what it's going to take from A to B, uh, because in driving, you also have to predict what another human being is going to do. And there's no AI in the world that, you know, can do that. Because you don't even know who the person is at the other mm-hmm. side line and what that human is going to do. So, I mean, perfection is very hard. And can AI get to 95% solutions? Can it get to 100% solutions? No. And, you know, so we're going to end up in the hybrid world. Uh, and, but we're already there. I mean, you know, you go to, you go to a restaurant today and algorithms decide what table you get. Algorithms decide what food you get served with. I mean, we're all living in a world in which we're coming. I mean, uh, George Hotz, a famous hacker, you know, posted on Twitter, now X, that you got to remember that in 15 years, you're going to be able to run a, a artificial general intelligence on your smartphone. That a smartphone 15 years from now will be able to have enough GPUs to be able to run this stuff natively on your phone. And, you know, at, at that point, we're in a world of smartphones with human, you know, a human attached as a peripheral, uh, uh, because our lives get rotten. I mean, that, you know, yeah, it's a very, a very bleak forecast. I don't know. Yeah. So I summarize this in. Uh, one simple sentence. I believe that evolution is smarter than AI. Agreed. I agree with you, Bill. Like, actually, history showed it to us and many times as well, I believe. Right. Evolution is, you know, uh, evolution is smarter than AI. And I, I do not fear for the human species. I mean, there's going to be millions of AIs and they're going to work in networks and they're going to have to learn how to cooperate. And I, I mean, it's no, they're no different than a, a child. I mean, I was dealing with a three-year-old over the weekend. And I mean, you know, I mean, you have to deal in the context of the three-year-old and talking right. things the three-year-old doesn't understand. You're just wasting your breath. I mean, the, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't understand that. He did under, he did assume that I was there only to play with him. And that I was to ignore his siblings and his parents, because after all, I was only there to play with him. Which is how a three-year-old would think. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, you know what I always mentioned, and some people even they said like you are so pro AI. I said I'm not pro AI, but exactly what you said now, Bill. I said think about it. AI is is not a is not a conscious uh, thing, right? It it needs someone to go and give the input so it gives the output. Let's say it's software at the end of the day, so you need to feed it the input so it can go. Of course, you can make it automatic, but still you need to feed it something so it, it gets you what you are waiting for. So this is why, you know, I, I, you know, when I saw the previous, I think, uh, I forget his name, but he was one of the leading, uh, leading the AI division at Google. And he was like saying, hey, we, we should stop, you know, and I don't like this messages usually that make people fearful or like, uh, you know, make them in a way his. Uh, you know, very, uh, I would say, you know, they, they push people in a way that they think that this technology is bad and we should, you know, not use it at all. So I don't like such articles, but, you know, what you mentioned now and from someone experienced like you've been really, uh, it, 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 I hope, you know, if someone is listening or watching us, we will, we'll get it. Um, as okay. we are coming I mean, my please. favorite, my favorite Star Trek episode is the one with Nomad. And Nomad is this device that shows up that is an incredibly omniscient AI. In the end, Kirk has it destroy itself because he shows that it's made a mistake and it can't deal with making a mistake and it basically goes down. Evolution is smarter than AI. And the episode is proof. I mean, are there going to be problems? Sure, there are going to be. Are there going to be jobs lost? Yes, there are. We got to figure that out. But if we don't get ahead of it, I mean, the more important thing, we're worrying about how to regulate something that is inherently unregulated. If you want to slow it down, there's a simple answer. Put a tax on GPUs. 
I, I, I mean, I can slow down the AI revolution very quickly. Destroy a <laughs> destroy a trillion dollars in market cap, but you put a tax on GPUs. If you want to slow it down, just tax everybody for every GPU they have operating. Now, now, now we've slowed down AI. It's not hard. You don't need to do anything. Just do that. I mean, I'm an economist. Uh, that's 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 what you would do. No one, no one is proposing. If you want to slow down AI, put a 10-year tax on GPUs. Makes sense. <laughs> Makes sense, I would say. Um, Bill, like, as we are coming to an end, like with your experience and with all, you know, you've seen it all, as we can say, what are your advice for, you know, new generation startup founders, new generation technologists? Like, you know, if, if they would run out with, with something today from you, you know, if you can say it in, in two or three sentences, what you would tell? I mean, when you see a technology that's going to win, you jump on it. I mean, if you're a technologist, I mean, investing in something that's going to be obsolete is just bad, right? It doesn't, you know, on the other hand, I mean, you, you can make a lot of money sometimes sticking with old technology because eventually you become invaluable and you just can extort money out. But uh, the world's going to change. It's going to change uh, you know, a very dramatic way. It's, it's fundamental principles, I think, though, that matter. I mean, it, it, you know, I learned long ago from a friend that the first principle of building systems is to encapsulate complexity. And that's how you, you build good redundant systems. Guess what? I learned that 50 years ago. It's still true. It'll still be true in 20 years. There are always parts of a system that are pretty routine. There are parts though, that are going to be incredibly complicated. What you want to do is, is to encapsulate the complexity and not let it spread like peanut butter throughout your code, because then it becomes unmaintainable and unchangeable, and then you obsolete and then it's gone. Uh, so I think it's focusing on, uh, on basic principles. And then, you know, if you're looking for senior jobs, senior jobs aren't about writing code. They're about managing people. And what you have to do is figure out who are the people that can really deliver. Uh, you know, there's a great interview with former President Obama that ran recently in which he said, what is the basic advice he would give? And, you know, his advice is actually very good. It is figure out how to get stuff. Figure out how to get stuff done in the thing. Architecture matters enormously. If you don't understand architecture, try and learn it. Because as new systems come in, you're always going to have to architect hybrids. And that's going to be, I mean, the winning AI isn't going to be the winner. The application of AI is going to be. And, 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 and you've got to figure out how to go do that. And, and that's, where, that's where the economic rewards are. I mean, yes, the people who create the tools uh, will make some money. But the real winning is going to come because you figure out how to take two points out of in gross margin, where you have, you have to add two points to gross margin. That's that's what's really valuable. That's great insight, Bill, from you. I think the book would be live on uh, September 12th, right? September 12th, yeah. And then I have another one coming that is an autobiography in another couple of months. So try to do what you just asked me, which is what's the career advice from uh, 60 years of doing this? Nice, nice. Well, that's what I did in the pandemic. <laughs> very nice. Very nice, Bill. I would make sure, you know, um, I, I have the website for the book, so I'll put this in the episode description. Um, yeah, and uh, anything, uh, you know, you. like to share before we, we end, Bill? No, thank you. I mean, look, I think this is the most profound question in, I mean, I, is AI going to be transformational? I mean, it's going to be incremental. It's not going to, going to wake up someday and say, oh, the world changed over overnight. No, it's going to be incremental. But it's going to be at a faster pace. Every one of these has come faster than the, the prior one. But the world is, is, is going to change. And what we have to figure out how to do is how to live there. And I mean, trying to slow it down, I think that's the least productive application of energy I can think of. 
Yeah, yeah, great insight. Well, Bill, thank you very much for uh, your time today with me. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I am sure that the audience, you know, whether they would be listening or watching this, they've got a lot and tons of, of information from you, from your experience. And I'd advise you to go and check, you know, the, the book when it's out and check the uh, Bill Sinek uh, profile also as well and say, you know, you, you are in like a moving library, but if you allow me to say this. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll come visit you in Dubai. Yeah, sure. So as usual, this is how I close. Guys, keep your feedback coming. Thank you for tuning in. And if you have any questions, you know how to find me. You can reach me on the social media, mainly LinkedIn, where I'm most active. And we'll meet again next episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world.